Uh, my objective is to be wildly more controversial than the last speaker. <laughs> I'd like to start by saying we all bandy about, every, practically every speaker has bandied about big data. Okay, so big, you know, according to the pundits, big data actually is best described by the three Vs. Big data means you've either got too much of it, there's big volume, or it's coming at you too fast, you got a velocity problem, or it's coming to you from too many different places and you've got an integration problem. So I'm going to talk about these three things separately because they lead to incredibly different discussions. Now the big volume stuff really to me looks like three quite different problems. Uh, the first one is if you're Zynga or somebody like that, you've got business stuff, and you're trying to do SQL analytics on a petabyte of data. So that's sort of the first kind of use case. The second use case, which I will talk about hopefully at some length, is business stuff, but SQL analytics is not what I want to do. I want to do linear regressions or curve fitting or data clustering or machine learning or something else. So basically business stuff with complex, i.e. non-SQL analytics. And the third thing we've heard a lot about in this conference is science stuff. Now, in a science talk, you never hear anybody mention relational database or group by group by department, average salary. No one has that kind of workload. So it's all complex analytics. So there are really five topics, three having to do with big volume, and one having to do with big velocity, and one having to do with big variety. And I will try and be obnoxious by saying what you ought to do if you are in each of these five use cases. So if you're trying to do little analytics, i.e. SQL, and you got a petabyte of data, this is very well addressed by the data warehouse guys. And they are happy to run a petabyte of data. Most, there are three or four vendors that can point to some user who's got a petabyte or more in production running on more than 100 nodes. So these guys scale to a petabyte or so at least and without a doubt, if you want to run 10 petabytes or 50 petabytes, they will be happy to continue to scale. So I think by the time you've loaded 50 petabytes, the various vendors in this, in this market will have gotten there. So anyway, so there's a bunch of choices and the vendors will point to successful customers. Uh, everybody satisfies the table stakes You've got to have a shared nothing architecture if you're going to scale to hundreds of nodes. Anything else, you are smoking something. In, sp in particular, you know, you cannot run shared disk on 100 nodes. That isn't going to work. And uh, I'm a huge fan of commodity parts. Uh, if you want your vendor to have a guided tour through your wallet, run proprietary iron. So I don't care if, if, it's, if your favorite software is packaged as an appliance or it simply runs on iron that you put together. As long as it's not proprietary, meaning you can swap out uh, the iron if you decide you don't like it and bring in other stuff. So avoid anybody who will, who will have, uh, have you by the throat and, and uh, and have a, the opportunity of a guided tour through your wallet. So here's my spin on the participants. There are people in this market who will sell you a row store and a row executor. And that, by the way, is all of the uh, traditional elephants. Uh, Microsoft Madison uh, looks like that. DB2 looks like that. Natiza looks like that, Oracle looks exactly like that, and I'll come back to Oracle in a minute. So the people who are traditional row stores, uh, the third one down is there are people who are traditional column stores. 
So Vertica, Sybase IQ, Paracel are probably the best known examples. These are systems that were written from square zero as a column store and have a column, column storage and have an executor that is column oriented. Then there are a couple of vendors who are what I call wannabes, who used to be row stores, realized that column stores are a really good idea and are in the process of converting to column storage uh, and that's Aster Data and Greenplum. Both of them have column storage uh, on disk, but have an executor that's still a row, row executor. So they're sort of in transition. Now, I just want to point out uh, something that's been said a couple of times. Oracle Exadata or Oracle Anything is not a column store. Uh, they their marketing claims it to be a hybrid uh, storage system, but it's not. And it's not a scalable shared nothing architecture. You can't run it on a thousand nodes. So uh, my favorite uh, sort of vignette is, uh, and those people who have gray hair may have heard this before, uh, on what hardware platform does Oracle run the best? Anybody have an idea? Exactly right, a 35 millimeter slide projector. Okay, so in round numbers, a, a, a column store is 50x a row store. So if a row store responds in a minute, a column store will respond in a second. There's a huge performance difference. I don't have time to go tell you exactly why, but there is. And of course, the wannabes are somewhere in between. So my prediction is that the only successful big data, small analytics architecture is going to be a real column store. There's such a performance advantage that everybody is going to have to get there. And in my opinion, all the successful vendors are either going to get there or they're not going to be successful. The elephants have a serious innovator's dilemma problem. And The Innovator's Dilemma is a great book written by Clayton Christensen called The Innovator's Dilemma. You should all go read it because all of the legacy system software companies on the planet are right up against that in spades. So anyway, uh, it's not obvious to me that the elephants are going to get to real column stores in a timely fashion. We'll see. And of course, the uh, I started Vertica, but I have nothing to do with HP uh, in its current, uh, Vertica in its current instantiation. But, you know, truth in advertising, uh, I started the company. Okay, so that's what I think is going to happen in small analytics. So if you're there, either get, get onto a column store or make sure that the vendor you're doing business with is going to get to a column store fast enough to meet your needs. So what in the world is the use case, uh, complex uh, big data, big analytics? That's people who want to do uh, the world of the quants uh, on a substantial amount of data. And I'm going to try and prove to you that really uh, what's underneath all that stuff is a dozen or so uh, common uh, matrix operations. So, you know, instead of giving you a science example that would require me to spend 10 minutes explaining jargon, uh, I'm going to give you a trivial example that we can all understand. So, consider uh, anybody who's a quant on Wall Street. Uh, if he wants to build an electronic trading model, the first thing he wants to do is find correlations between the stock movements of two stocks, IBM and Oracle. So he's got the, he's got the closing trading price by day for the last 20 years for both stocks, two big time series. And of course, he says, well, what's the covariance between these two time series? For those of you who need a statistics lesson, it's on the red stuff at the bottom of the slide. Well, that's not very hard to do. 
But what he really wants to do is an all pairs covariance. Find me everything that's correlated with everything. So do that calculation on the previous slide for all pairs of stocks on the New York Stock Exchange, about 4,000 of them. So the data is uh, 4,000 stocks, and the last five years is about 1,000 days. Last 20 years is 4,000 days. So you want to do that all pairs covariance on that red matrix. So the rows are stocks, the columns are closing prices. And you say, well, I'm not daunted by the size of this thing. The minute you can do this, the quant will say, do it for hourly data. That sends you up one order of magnitude. Do it for all stocks on the planet. That sends you up another order of magnitude. So the quants have the great property that the minute you can solve their problem, they're going to define a harder one for you. So you've got to do this on very big uh, pieces of data. Well, what is this calculation, all pairs covariance? Well, that red stuff is an array. It's not a table. It's an array. So you want to matrix multiply that array times its transpose. That's the calculation that you're doing to solve the quant guy's problem. And except for you know, some constants, that is the calculation. So the inner loop of the quant guy stuff is matrix operations, in this case, multiply and transpose. Now, I ask you, if you're interested, try this calculation with your favorite relational database system. You can, of course, construct that data as, an, as arrays. You can go to Joey Hellerstein and get the code for matrix multiply out of Madlib. It turns out to be a, a self-join three ways uh, of array. And you just look at that code and you say, boy, this looks slow. So the other way to think about it is that if you're doing matrix multiply, there's five orders of magnitude performance difference between coding matrix multiply in Python at the one hand and coding it in Scalapack or BLAST optimized uh, matrix packages. You do it in SQL, you're going to be doing it at about Python performance. And you want to do it you know, in BLAST performance. So uh, try this in SQL and uh, take a long vacation before you uh, will get the answer. So how do you do this problem now? How do people really do this kind of stuff? Well, you can say, well, I'm going to run my favorite stat package. And we heard about SAS, R, and MATLAB in the course of this conference. So you can certainly do that, but you're going to be in a world of hurt because those systems don't have any data management. The minute I want to say, do me an all pairs covariance, but only do it for those stocks whose company headquarters is in San Francisco, got to have data management. Moreover, uh, we'll get to file system storage some more in a minute, but you're storing stuff in the file system. And that's going to give you, in my opinion, a headache managing it long term. And then R doesn't scale. R is a main memory stat package. The minute stuff doesn't fit in main memory, you're toast. Moreover, it's not parallel over multiple nodes. Uh, you've got to get revolution, uh, which will do a little bit better. But you have a non-scalable main memory system with no data management. That doesn't sound very appealing. OK, so let's say let's, let's drink the, the uh, Dave DeWitt Kool-Aid and run a relational database system. Well, the trouble is, it'll do the data management just great. That's what it's been doing for 20 years at great performance. But what about matrix multiply? MADLIB, as I've said a couple minutes ago, uh, that, that requires you to go out on a vacation before you get the answer. And it only does some of the required operations. So you say, well, I've heard about UDFs. Uh, so why don't I code this stuff as user-defined functions? The problem there is that you need parallel user-defined functions to run this over multiple nodes. And all of these codes actually turn out to be iterations with stopping conditions and data interchange in the middle of them. So they can't, they don't, the, 
Postgres style UDF model isn't anywhere near powerful enough to do them. So this doesn't sound very appealing. So you say, what do people really actually do right now? They say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run R and I'm going to run a relational database system. So I'll do some data management in, the, uh, in Oracle. And then I'm going to take the result and I'm going to ship it over the wire to my math package, converting data formats in the process. And uh, I'm going to do the, do the stat calculation in R, and then I'm going to put the answer back. That requires two, two moving parts, and we've heard forever in this conference, simplicity is good. So this is anti-simplicity. Moreover, R still doesn't scale, and so you're still hosed, and you've got to learn two systems, and uh, we've been hearing increasingly that the network wire is ultimately the, the performance problem, and you're moving everything around, which is you're not, you're moving the data to the computation, and that's never a good idea. So this doesn't sound very appealing. So my favorite alternative is to say, well, you've got array stuff. Why not run an array database system? So arrays are kind of fun because if you simulate an array as a table, you get the stuff on the left. You have these dimensions and you store them explicitly and in an array you never have to do that. And then arrays fundamentally do two-dimensional or three-dimensional or four-dimensional clustering and tables are never going to do that. So arrays have innate advantages if you have array data. No surprise. So of course I'm a big fan of my favorite array database system, which is SciDB that was mentioned uh, yesterday. So basically it does data management on arrays, not on tables. There's no notion of tables in SciDB. And it does you know, ma massively scalable uh, sharding just like you'd expect. And it's intended to work for the people who do science stuff. Science guys never want to discard data ever. Even if it's wrong, they want to keep the old wrong values for provenance reasons. So uh, we, we allow you to update data, but you, you don't overwrite it. It does Postgres-style time travel efficiently, supports uncertainty in the science world. It's not like DeWitt's salary is a known number. You know, I get a sensor observation that has an error bar. And like essentially all current data management systems, it's open source. So have at it if you like it. Runs in the cloud, runs in a private grid, commodity hardware, Linux, TCP IP, all the nice stuff. Now notice I haven't mentioned Hadoop yet. <laughs> so, and I'll come back to Omar's redefinition of Hadoop in a minute. But Hadoop is being, the way it's being marketed is it is all things to all people. So if you want to do simple analytics, you want to run anything you'd write in Hive, it's going to be 100x slower than in anybody's parallel database system for a huge number of technical reasons. So Andrew was, was too accommodating. Uh, Hadoop, Hive and Hadoop is going to be disastrously slower than any parallel database system. If you're coding complex analytics, you know, like matrix multiply, or something that boils down to matrix multiply as an inner loop, anything you code in Mahout or Pragel is this kind of stuff. Again, complex analytics, 100 Hadoop is 100 times slower than what you can do if you're serious. And if you're serious, you want to run stuff in Scalapack and or ARPack. That's the fastest thing on the planet. Suppose you're doing conventional scientific modeling. You're doing climate simulations or some other parallel programming. Uh, if you're doing, uh, if you're doing ETL, which is Omar's example, or you're doing GREP, 
If you're doing something that's embarrassingly parallel, Hadoop is great. Anything else is disastrous. And why, is, why does Hadoop suck on everything that isn't embarrassingly parallel? Because its communication model is absolutely stone age. So it lacks stateful computations, it lacks point-to-point -point communication, and that stuff is not about to get fixed. So Hadoop is good at certain things, and if you restrict uh, your attention to exactly those things, you will be fine. But that isn't what's happening in the marketplace. In the marketplace, Hadoop is marketed as the best thing since sliced bread, av available to do any of these things, and they're all going to be a disaster unless they're embarrassingly parallel. So my, my expectation is that Hadoop is routinely being piloted in the real world on small problems. The minute those guys start to scale, Hadoop is going to hit a bad wall. And these guys are going to be in bad shape. Now, uh, if you're programming in Hive, any parallel database vendor will, has a Hive interface and will say, well, when you hit the wall, come see me. You can run your Hive queries unaltered on my parallel database system external to Hadoop, and it's all going to work fine. So anyway, uh, I think Hadoop is current. Uh, most of you should know about the Gartner Group hype cycle. Uh, Hadoop is absolutely at the top of the Gardner Group hype cycle. And right beyond it is the Valley of Despair. And that's going to be steep and dramatic. And, and I think Hadoop is going to fall quickly out of favor as people figure out what it's good for and what's not good for. Now, Omar redefined Hadoop as, a, as HDFS, which is not the MapReduce piece. I don't have any problem with HDFS. It's a parallel file system. There are lots of parallel file systems. It's one of them. By all means, go ahead and use it. And if there are tools on top of a parallel file system that you like, sounds good to me. But don't consider that a data management system. OK. So my prediction, the bloom will come off the rose. OK. So. Complex analytics, in my opinion, complex analytics are very quickly going to replace simple analytics as the name of the game in enterprise computing. Why, why do I say that? Well, you guys are all about to be pitched by Progressive and other automobile insurance companies to put a gizmo in your car. Progressive has been doing this for about a decade. And they reward you uh, for being a safe driver, meaning don't jackrabbit start, don't slam on the brakes. And they're watching. This is an arms race because all the other guys are saying, well, why don't I reward you if you stay out of East Palo Alto at 4 in the morning? That's not a very safe place to go. Uh, I'm going to start looking at not only how you drive, but where you drive. So all of a sudden, there's 1,000 or 2,000 variables that you're recording about each customer. So you've got a million customers going one way, 1,000 variables going the other way, and you're trying to fit a model to that data. That's complex analytics. SQL is not going to help you with that problem. So as people move into data mining, data clustering, model fitting, any of that stuff is not SQL. And so, in my opinion, that will become uh, the thing that's important because that's the high value stuff. And so it'll be, in my opinion, complex analytics is where big data is moving. OK, now let's go to science data. Now, it's unfortunate, but you guys don't count. You're a zero billion dollar market. And, but in spite of that, you're in luck. Uh, You've got lots of arrays. We've heard about them in the last two days. Uh, and it's not SQL analytics on arrays. It's, it's the complicated stuff that I've been talking about. You've got some graphs. In my opinion, the best way, if you've got graphs plus arrays, 
is to model your graphs as sparse arrays. In other words, this is a non-null element at position ij if there's an arc from i to j. That way you get a single uniform model and you can do graph stuff plus array stuff in the same system. That, as, uh, unfortunately, you can't simulate arrays as graphs, but you can simulate graphs as arrays. So RD, relational systems suck on both of these kinds of data. And so I'm a huge fan of array database systems, which have a po the possibility of making you happy uh, downstream. And the great thing is that the enterprise guys have the same kind of problem. So progressive uh, you know, wants to worry about the same kind of array data that you have. So you can uh, draft uh, the enterprise guys as they move into this kind of stuff. Now please, please don't tell me you like the file system. <laughs> and I think the interesting thing was three years ago at this conference, you heard people say, would stand up and give talks, you know, like, I have a petabyte of data and I'm happy putting it in the Andrew file system or in whatever. Now at this conference, you kind of hear, well, I'm doing file stuff, but I have a real problem managing the metadata. Or, I, you know, I have a real problem, you know, keeping track of provenance. And when I want to share it with somebody else, boy, that's kind of hard because I'm sending a binary dump and and sort of documenting that is hard. So maybe these database guys have something, there's something to it. Anyway, keep, let it, keep, you know, you guys, you scientists need a brain transplant to move to database systems. You know, keep, keep, the, keep, the, keep it going. Uh, you're, you'll, you'll get there. <laughs> okay, new topic. So that's big volume. But to me, big data also means people who have a velocity problem. So every, uh, every electronic trading company on the planet, trading volume is going through the roof. It's breaking everybody's infrastructure that tries to look at the, you know, the Bloomberg feed as it goes across your screen, but it's going by at gazillions a second. Breaks everybody's infrastructure and trading volumes are just going to go up and not down. So there are lots of people with a big velocity problem. The thing that's really going to get everybody is we are in the process of sensor tagging everything on the planet of material significance. So we talked about car insurance. The car, guy, the car insurance guys want to sensor tag your car, your, P, your smartphone you know, is, is, is a sensor tagging system. Uh, as the, uh, you know, the marathon runners get bibs that are sensor tagged, uh, taxi cabs get sensor tagged, the world gets sensor tagged, and that's going to create some very high, vo high velocity applications. We heard the Zynga guys say, uh, I've got to store the state of Farmville. It's an OLTP database problem, but at very, very high velocity. So there's a whole bunch of areas where velocity is just going through the roof. So what do I do with high velocity applications? It seems to me there, there are two kinds of high velocity problems. The first one is if I have an electronic trading system, I'm looking for a banana followed uh, within 10 seconds, 10 milliseconds by a strawberry or some other sort of complex pattern uh, on the data that's going by me. So that's big pattern, but I don't have to keep much state. The only state I have is what, what these rules are. And the complex event processing guys that were mentioned by one of the earlier speakers today, that's the sweet spot on their market, which is in comes a fire hose, and you're looking for patterns in the fire hose. So run your favorite CEP system, uh, and as was mentioned earlier, most of them have a scalability problem. However, there's a lot of people that have a big state little pattern problem. So for instance, if you're an electronic trading co uh, company, and there's one I'm aware of in particular that has a trading desk in London, another one in New York, another one in Hong Kong, another one in Tokyo, all run independently. 
the CEO wants to uh, assemble his real-time position for or against every stock on the planet so that he can calculate his risk. He doesn't want to be too far bent out of shape in case a particular stock goes against him. So alert me if my exposure is greater than something or other. Same fire hose, but he's just trying to construct a state. And the processing is pretty trivial. In, in comes a trade. You simply want to increment or decrement your company's position. This looks like very high performance OLTP. You want to be able to update the database at the speed of light. And so according to the sales guys I talk about who are selling CEP, there seems to be four, three or four big state little processing pat, uh, applications for every one CEP application. So my suspicion is very high performance OLTP is where the high velocity market really is going. So of course, what do you do if you have uh, one of these very high performance, low latency, update intensive applications? Well, you can run the elephants, which I call old SQL. You can run no SQL, which was part of what was talked about uh, in the questions to Andrew Lamb. There's about 75 or so vendors, all of whom will tell you, give up SQL and give up ACID in order to go fast. And then there's a cast of characters, and I would include myself in this bucket, who say, retain SQL and retain ACID, but go fast by getting rid of the elephant's architecture and replacing it by something that's way faster. So why not use an elephant? Well, they're too slow by a couple orders of magnitude for this market. I mean, they are non-starters. Uh, you cannot do anything in any one of the elephant systems in one millisecond. That is impossible. And so these guys want to update their state in one millisecond. And so they are just off by a huge number in this marketplace. And of course, why are they slow? The answer is because there are 3 million lines of legacy code originally written in the 1970s or 1980s. So uh, if you want a whole bunch of details, uh, a bunch of us wrote a paper in VLDB 2007 called Through the OLTP Looking Glass. Check out that paper for why old SQL is a non-starter in this market. I only have six minutes left, so I can't tell you much more about it. So let's turn to my favorite whipping boy, NoSQL. So give up SQL. Now, Mohan and I have gray hair. We were around in the 70s. We listened to the debate which raged through the whole 70s of CODASIL versus relational database systems, low level record at a time versus high level non-procedural. That was one hands down by high level languages. High level languages are good. They do not have any performance penalty. They give you data independence. They give you code that's easier to read. They are just plain goodness. It's interesting to note that the major NoSQL guys, Cassandra and Mongo, who used to have this record at a time, low level manipulation stuff, have defined higher level languages which look like SQL. Surprise, surprise. So SQL is good, and high-level languages are good. Now, give up ACID. Now, if you give up ACID, then the database system doesn't help you. If you have to move $100 from account A to account B, and you don't have ACID, then you may be out $100 if a, if a crash happens inadvertently, or the bank may be out 100 bucks. Either outcome is bad. So if you need ACID, you've got to tear your hair out in user code doing transaction support in user code. I would not advise anybody to do that. That is no fun. And you say, well, I don't need ACID now. Can you guarantee you won't need ACID tomorrow? Because 
if you need acid tomorrow because your company buys a plumbing supply company in Hong Kong and all of a sudden you've got to move spigots from Hong Kong to Boston, you're out of luck if you're running a NoSQL engine. They are not going to give you acid. You're back to coding this stuff in user space and I wouldn't wish that on anybody. So I'm not a big fan of uh, NoSQL. Uh, as a, I, would, I would sort of mimic uh, and sort of just say again what DeWitt said. I can't understand why these systems are so popular. Anyway, so I'm a huge fan of NoSQL. What does NoSQL mean? Well, get rid of the 30-year-old architectures that the elephants are selling. So OLTP is largely a main memory problem. So use a main memory database system. That's a good idea. Open source is universally a good idea. Shared nothing, sharding, Linux, TCP, IP, that, that's sort of just goodness in general. And you've got to figure out how to do ACID support without it costing you an arm and a leg. Now, in a main memory database system, if you sort of re read or write, say, 200 records, in main memory, that takes maybe 100, mi 100 microseconds. There is no sense in taking a scheduling stall for a 100 microsecond thing. So run transactions to completion. Run them single threaded, no locking, uh, you know, goodness, get rid of overhead. And that's a her her heretical thought to the elephants because they were designed at a time when you had stuff on disk and you had to take disk stalls and then you had to run something else. There aren't any disk stalls in OLTP anymore. Uh, you've got to get rid of multi-threading overhead. And in the Through the Looking Glass paper, there's a long discussion of why that kills you. So VoltDB is a single-threaded system. You don't have any contention for B-trees or any of that stuff. This runs about 100 times faster than your favorite elephant system on TPCC. So you want to go 100x, you got to do something like this. There are a bunch of startups that are doing this sort of stuff. Uh, as near as I can tell, they're all copying me. Uh, there's a thing called SQL Fire from VMware. There's a thing called MemSQL from out here in the valley. Uh, there's a thing called NuoDB. So there's a bunch of startups that are sort of in this sort of vein. So check them out if you want to go, f if you have a high velocity problem. Okay, so I said there's one more thing, which is suppose you have to deal with stuff from too many places. Typical enterprise that Mohan sells to has 5,000 operational systems. And only a few of these get into the data warehouse, maybe 10 or 20. So what do you do with the other 4980? And what do you do with, if you want to integrate some public data into these 4980 data sources? And by the way, the CFO is keeping your company's budget on his local laptop on his spreadsheet. So what about all of this stuff? It's the long tail, and there's huge amounts of it. Now, the standard wisdom from the ETL guys is you have a programmer look at each data source, figure out what it is, write a script that converts from it to some global schema that you've predefined. It's a human intensive op process. You cannot do this for 5,000 data sources. You're simply toast. So what's clear is that you've got to take care of the rest of your data, which is all of this stuff. And uh, it's a treasure trove of incredibly valuable information. Most everybody agrees with that. And by and large, this is unaddressed. So we have a project at MIT, integrate the rest of your data. And you have to scale to thousands, thousands of data sources, which means you've got to have this be a machine learning system that asks a human when necessary. It can't be the other way around. And of course, you've got to deal with the messiest of all messy data. You know, data never is clean, never, ever, ever. And by the way, the task is never done. The minute you integrate the first 5,000, then the CEO says, well, here's another 
uh, 2,000 data sources that are probably interesting, you know, do those. So anyway, uh, I think this is an interesting research problem to figure out how to do uh, data integration at scale. As near as I can tell, every major enterprise would buy this if there was a good solution. And, and I think in terms of the big data world, this is what's eventually going to kill everybody because I can see how to solve all the other problems. Uh, I should stop. I'm, I'm in the red zone by <laughs> some number of seconds. So thank you. So let's try one or two questions so I can see one, of course, somewhere. Not on. There we go. I only have two questions. Um, the most natural. Uh, so, what if you have? What if you want to do uh, complex analytics on a wide variety of data that's all simultaneously arriving at very high rates? <laughs> well, the, yeah. <laughs> well, the thing thing that's really interesting, which I thought was fascinating with the Zynga talk was Zynga has a big volume problem and a big velocity problem. And so if, if you've got all of these at once, I mean, I've given no thought to that. But I think my point of view is rather than take on something that's impossibly hard, if you take them on one by one, at least you have a chance of solving them. So I haven't given no thought to how to do that. All right. Uh, second question, since you mentioned that Hadoop's going to hit a wall. So Druba kind of went through the numbers at Facebook and their largest system, and there's, there's other smaller ones at other companies, but their largest one is about 100 petabytes. I'm just wondering when that will hit the wall. Well, I think, uh, I say I, I wouldn't put words in, in uh, Facebook's uh, mouth, but they're running a 2700 node Hadoop cluster accessed entirely in Hive. I would make the prediction that, that's, that they could set up a 50-node Teradata or Vertica or dot, dot, dot cluster and replace 2,700 nodes by 50. It's a no-brainer to say 50 nodes, 2,700. And so I think people rationally, people who are not Facebook, but are you and me, when presented with that trade-off, we'll, 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 we'll choose to run something that's a factor of 50 faster. I think, I think so we, we should drag Andrew and Lamb back up here. But so every time Zynga says, I want to go bigger, faster, wider, Vertica says, OK. And I say, I guess Andrew said they've got three petabyte customers. And so they scale to whatever, whatever is required. And, and if that takes removing whatever the next bottleneck is, that, that happens. No question there, but it's uh, OK, but I guess my point of view is that Facebook has the hardest data management problem on the planet, in, in my opinion. And yes, yes, you can design for Facebook, but they're not going to buy it anyway. They're going to they're going to roll their own. And so, so I think, you know, there there's, uh, and so I think if you if you engineer for the hardest problem on the planet, uh, that isn't the way to make a good business. Uh, the last question. Comments about acid. Uh, where it seems that you imply that NoSQL means you have to give up ACID. I don't think this is necessarily true. There are certainly certain systems that force you to make this trade-off, but it's not like, you know, because you have NoSQL, you have no ACID. Um, well, as near as I can tell, almost all the NoSQL vendors either have single record ACID only. So, you, so as long as my transaction is update one record, it's acid. Yeah, that, that's true, but it still means that if you are withdrawing 100 bucks from an account, for instance, then you don't necessarily run into the situation that... If, if you're doing single record transactions, you're absolutely correct. But the minute, the minute you have a multi-record transaction, you're toast. So if I, in Zynga's case, if I want to move and shoot at the same time, that's a multi-record update 
transactionally. Yeah, I still don't think it's it's it necessarily. Maybe we don't have good systems in place right now in the NoSQL world to do multi-transaction, uh, multi-row transactions. But Google, for instance, has shown that it was possible with Megastore and F1. Um, and also, I wanted to comment yeah, F, on F1 is a relational database system. Looks exactly like like it's a, not. Re yeah, it's not and, really. And, uh, and, and so, I, so I want to back up. One thing I want to say is that uh, people mention key value stores. Well, a key value store is a two column table, key and payload. And there are four operations, you know, new, delete, get, and update. So VoltDB implemented those four things as stored procedures to a two column table, shardable, scalable infinitely, and it's running around 7x Cassandra uh, on, a, you know, apples to apples. So, so but it's in there's no only. good reason to run a key value store because a relational database system does that with both feet and one hand nailed to the floor. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of scale. What? It's a matter of scale. Like, VolDB probably will perform very well as long as everything is in memory. Uh, I, Yeah, MongoDB also has the problem that you need to have everything fit in memory. I don't know, like, I think it's so the, your question, so your anyway, question about why people like Hadoop, I think it's because it scales. And if you look at the Facebooks and the Googles, and I don't think they are an exception to the rule. Other companies so just work at a smaller scale. So... Yeah, I'm not claiming I'm not claiming it's a new concept. It's just yeah. right. I was okay. Going. We'll take this offline. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, by by the way, uh, main memory currently costs maybe twenty thousand dollars a terabyte. And so, if you and if you say I and you're not Facebook, but everybody else, a terabyte OLTP database is a really really big database. So, if your stuff doesn't fit in main memory now, it soon will. And Volt, Volt runs 3 million transactions a second on a 384 node, you know, SGI cluster. Yeah, I mean, it's getting stuff to scale linearly is no big deal. I mean, as, as Dave said, there's nothing new here. You know, every, I mean, Teradata did this starting in, you know, 1986. I know Todd can, Walters can probably tell us. 84, 84. Okay. So, so uh, I think the, the biggest problem I have with the NoSQL guys is none of them know anything about databases. <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay. you, you guys are learning on the job. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Mike.